So hello everybody, uh, welcome once again to Games Beyond Entertainment. This is day four and session four. There's gonna be another one around five this afternoon. We have uh, four talks today, uh, two uh, short papers and two uh, long full papers. And we start with one of the full ones. Um, the title of the first one is Satirical Game Design, the case of the board game construction boom and it's presented by a set of people all um, actually hailing from the very institute I'm in. So uh, Jasper, I know you have a video, but you will be answering questions. Please, the floor is yours. Hello, I'm Jasper, and I'm presenting a paper I've written together with Stefano Caselli, Krista Bonella Rutter Giappone, and Stefano Gualeni. The paper is entitled Satirical Game Design, the case the board game construction boom the presentation is only 12 minutes long so hopefully i managed to interest you enough to read the full paper we, we go into full details on the decisions and the theory so what is construction boom construction boom is a board game um, that stefano and myself call a work of playable satire the game satirizes the maltese construction industry and in this talk I hope to give you an idea of what that means and the theory of behind how we try to achieve this satirical game. So as context is central to uh, satire, I'll start with a bit of context. The stock was supposed to be happening in Malta. So originally I was gonna ask you to just look out of the window, maybe ask you your experiences uh, around the island with the local construction industry, maybe even ask you to listen so, in this case, since we're not here, we're in a virtual format, I'll have to provide the context in a different way. So, living in Malta, we're struck by the approach of the local construction industry. It's apparent nonchalance and complete focus on maximizing profit without regard for really any other consideration. Disregarding architectural consistency, preservation of historical buildings, and the sturdiness of building. And although you can't see the sturdiness of the buildings necessarily, here we see a string of incidents as accelerated in 2019 and we have continued even to July 2020 where a collapse uh, injured and killed a worker. In this case I had stopped at 2019 because this is the time that we were developing the game and writing the paper. So this was, up to that moment, the, the key, what prompted us to continue. The American columnist Molly Ivins wrote, satire is traditionally the weapon of the powerless against the powerful. And that's exactly how we, and presumably how many of the average people on the island, um, felt and still feel about the situation. So satire is a well-established, if somewhat difficult to define a literary device. Um, and now we're applying it to games. Um, our view on satire in games has been set out in detail by Caselli et al, who draw on the cleric. And basically they have taken this from the cleric and sort of transposed it onto to games. Um, in essence, there are three critical aspects. So the critical intent, entertaining purpose, and the interaction between them. And if you want a more detailed analysis of it, I will go over it briefly and try to avoid too many spoilers. But I recommend, obviously, staying online for the more detailed presentation. So we see the non-essential features typical of satire, so irony, caricature, parody, as tools uh, fulfilling the purpose of critiquing and entertaining. So we've referred to these tools as satiric strategies. And I may use that term uh, more frequently. So traditionally, these tools have been limited to the literary, to the dramatic, and the carnivalesque formats. But uh, games have a unique ability to critique and entertain through procedural rhetoric, as highlighted in Ian Bogus's persuasive games. So what did we do? We combined the theoretical approach um, and the key elements of satire set up by Caselli et al, due to be presented later, and have used also the framework designed by Trenner et al, 
which was specifically created as a tool for journalists to create news games. So together, these provided the foundation for our preliminary evaluation of how satire can be expressed through the various game elements. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the intent and communicating this intent is very important for the work to be identified as satire. And in designing the game, we wanted to be aware of this intent. And to that purpose, we used the concept of the implied designer. So while Fun Mosular and Gualani point out that we cannot and do not have to know the intentions of the actual author, we still interpret creative works um, on the basis of the perceived intentions of its creators. So knowing the satiric intent of the author has been a critical factor for both the persuasiveness of the piece, as well as even the piece to be identified as a satire at all by the recipient. So in this case, we see what is essentially the same headline. There are some satiric strategies, obviously, in, in one of them. But at a quick glance at the authors, you can see quite quickly which one is the satire and which one is just a news article. So we, as actual designers of Construction Boom, had this advantage that we were able to discuss and annotate our design choices in relation to our intentions. So we know that we had a critical intent and we know that we wanted the game to entertain as well. Our decisions were anchored in this um, idea of providing the player with enough information to grasp our synthetic intent, while at the same time maintaining a balance with the entertainment aspect of it. So there obviously are many ways to read a game. You use the information that you get to read a game. Um, Janet Murray, for example, reads Septris as the perfect enactment of the overtasked lives of Americans, Stephen Poole reads Pac-Man as a metaphor for rampant consumerism. But these readings uh, only hold true as much as the interpreter sort of admits all the other information. There are many elements of the experience of these games that do not support or fit this reading coherently, as uh, Trenard will point out. Um, for example, in the case of Pac-Man, there's no relation or, or analogy between the ghosts and consumerism. So the player will see this, um, and the other instances in which the analogy doesn't uh, match up, and these breaks in analogies will weaken the reading of the allegory. Um, another critical aspect of satire is the entertainment uh, aspect, um, and we've drawn the definition of entertainment from the various manifestations as set out as in Fodor et al. He, has a list of these various types of entertainment definitions. And to entertain its players, construction boom relies on a sense of achievement, um, a manifestation typical in games. So regrettably, it is statistically unlikely that all of you or any of you have played construction boom, and you're missing out, by the way. So I'm going to give you a, a brief summary of what the game entails. A two-player competitive tile laying game. You take on the role of construction tycoons in Malta, strategizing and sabotaging to complete your building contract and rake in the cash. The standard game of construction boom has four rounds. The contractor needs to have placed a certain amount of one type of material on the board by the end of the round. They're penalized when they fail. The saboteur will try and make those penalties accumulate by, for example, placing roofs in inconvenient places, or by overloading buildings. So there you have it. Um, basically, it's a construction game where you destroy buildings to make a profit, or build them up to make a profit. So now I'll briefly elaborate on a few of the satiric strategies used in Construction Boom, which help inform the player of Decision, the intentions of the designer. Uh, the paper has a full analysis divided along all of these uh, components. We, these have been defined by Trenner et al. And we listed them and addressed them in this format for convenience. Um, but it's important to note that the operational components on their own are not sufficient uh, information, do not provide sufficient information to players for them to reach a conclusion on the game's satiric intent. These need to be interacting with the interpreted components, such as themes. The most obvious ways is the artwork. So the artwork of Construction Boom uses 
caricature, but when playing the game, you often end up constructing familiar scenes. So here you have an image of what is a typical um, urban situation in Malta, and here is sort of the reflection how you would, would interpret it in the game. And you can see as well, there are certain motifs of the unfinished, which are floors that are left completely open. Um, and obviously, it's a recognizable tableau. Another aspect that we had used was the game meter, where a simple point system would have been enough. Um, we chose to express it in currency purposefully. So in conclusion, I'd like to offer a few key takeaways from our exploration of satire in the board game form. Um, so the first thing is the notion of the implied design, as proposed by Van der Mosseler and Gualeni. It has proven a useful design perspective, which helped us uh, maintain conceptual parity and ensure that we constantly asked ourselves the question of how a player might interpret a certain component or element of the game which kind of leads into the next part of it, which is that the satiric strategies using the implied designer also further highlighted to us how the various operational elements and interpreted components are fused together uh, through the interpretation of players. So if you change one aspect of it, it impacts another aspect of it. Um, and it's evident in satiric intent in construction boom, but also in cases where satiric intent is not necessarily clear. And then finally, the fusion of operational elements of prominent feature in games and interpreted components, which is present in most literary works, would appear to be unique to games. And game designers have started harnessing this novel aspect in games such as Rod Humble's The Marriage, and also applied with satiric intent in Malindustria's phone story and Malindustria's McDonald's video game. So finally, the framework we provide here uh, can be used as a, as a tool to ensure that your intentions, the designer's intentions, are accurately reflected in the game, even if those intentions are to cultivate a certain level of ambiguity. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it, and I am available for any questions, and I know we're short on time, so I will be on the chat, and if you want to shoot me an email later on, I'd like to give the email address for it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jasper. As you mentioned in the chat, there's a question for you that is particularly interesting, and we have a couple of minutes, so please be quick. You are muted, Jasper. You need yeah. to unmute yourself. That's, to that sorry, that's, that's a really, really interesting question. I got a bit excited. Um, by, by it um, and forgot to unmute myself. So the construction boom obviously in itself did not have a commercial goal, right? We, in the sense that satire has to entertain, so maybe you'd look at it as an entertaining goal, not necessarily commercially oriented, but there are uh, a number of video games that argue their way into being or seem to be satires but, um, so as, for example, there's a, I think it was Wolfenstein, um, where they are, where it's supposed to be a satire. There's, I think it's the, as well, um, I forgot the name of the, the game we wrote about it in the paper. Uh, Far Cry 5, I think it was, as well, has, these are games that have satirical elements. But commercial games tend to sort of, shy away from going on the full satirical message, which, which we were trying to do, like make sure that nobody can misinterpret it as anything other than a satire, which was the goal of our, our research and how we approached. But yeah, there are games, commercial games, and they that tend towards satire, but they sort of don't go the full way. They want to leave that level of ambigu ambiguity. Hey Jasper, um, I want to thank you. There's not, not, much, not much time left. And uh, there, Alessia Serrada has a question for you, which you might want to answer in this call. Uh, we need to move on to the second talk, which is a collaborative, um, about a collaborative paper between UCL, the University of Malta, and the University of Luxembourg. We have two of the authors here that I know of, at least Antonio and Calliope, I can see. 
Um, this is a 10 minute, uh, sorry, a full paper uh, titled Reliving the Experience of Visiting a Gallery, Methods for Evaluating Informal Learning in Games for Cultural Heritage. Uh, Calliope, please take it away. Hey, thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Let's see, can you see my presentation? Not yet. Okay, let's give it a couple of seconds. Uh, your screen sharing, okay, resume, you're with me. I get an error message that my screen sharing is paused. Adonis, are you able to say something? Okay. I'll try to do it again. You don't have PowerPoint open uh, like on full screen mode and then do the presentation. Okay. Now we can see it. Now you can see it, perfect. That's right. Okay. Thank okay, you. all right. So, um, hi, I'm, I'm Calliope and along with Antonios and Catherine from University of Malta and University of Luxembourg, uh, we wrote the paper on, mainly on the findings of the cross project, Reliving the Experience of Visiting a Gallery, Methods for Evaluating Informal Learning, in games for cultural heritage. Um, when evaluating the effectiveness of gamified application experiences in cultural heritage venues in terms of informal learning outcomes, one of the core challenges that we faced was the complexity involved in uh, conducting a museum visitor evaluation, which would allow us as, a research, as researchers to measure the impact of gamification uh, on user engagement and the enhancement of the cultural heritage experience on learning. Um, so in our paper, we reviewed the related literature uh, regarding the application of different user evaluation methods, but we focused on the uh, REMIND protocol for conducting experiments with museum visitors and on how interactions with game for applications while visiting a cultural site, in our case, the National Gallery of London, uh, can be evaluated by reflecting out loud on a recorded experience. And we conclude with recommendations, challenges and future steps in evaluating games for cultural heritage um, using this out loud approach. Briefly uh, about the project, the cross call project was an Horizon uh, 2020 project funded by the EU under the broader theme of innovation ecosystems of digital cultural assets. It finished in February 2019. Uh, it was run for three years and the consortium brought together a, a group of uh, digital humanists, social scientists, computer scientists and museum professionals from uh, 11 project uh, partners across eight European countries as well as 14 associate non-paid partners, uh, some of which participated as venues for experimentation. Um, the project has built, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, an open technological platform where we can find multiple technologies, including the cross cut knowledge base and all the tools and the services developed by the technical partners uh, as software modules. The technologies were usable and extendable to facilitate the development of custom-made mobile applications. Um, and the four standalone pilot applications that have been developed by the project acted as demonstrators of the different technologies of the platform. More details you can find on the CrossCode website and on the deliverables of the, of the project. 
Now, the four pilots of the project, they were based at distinctive places of historical interest, representative of different cultural heritage venues found across Europe. Pilot one, where uh, we focused our paper as well, was run at the National Gallery and represents uh, a large venue. The application based here aimed to demonstrate the personalization features uh, and functions of the platform. Uh, and how this can facilitate the discovery and exploration of connections between objects, the paintings, painters, uh, the people, and events across Western European art history. The second pilot, Pilot 2, interconnected the small venues of uh, the Roman Healing Spa in Chaves and Lugo in Portugal, uh, the archaeological sites of Montegrotto Terme in uh, Italy, and the ancient sanctuary of Epidaurus in Greece. Uh, this pilot concentrated on the gaming features of the platform and allowed the users to explore and learn about similarities and differences uh, between uh, traditions and ancient cultures across different countries. Uh, pilot 3 uh, was run at the small archaeological museum of Tripolis in Greece. It centered around 15 objects that were used to create narratives uh, on the life of women across ancient and modern societies as a different way of presenting archaeological finds. And finally, uh, Pilot 4 connected the two cities of Luxembourg and Valletta in Malta under the broad theme of migration. Uh, the application was a geolocated outdoor game where the user discovered and explored the city through a treasure hunt. Now, due to the different venues uh, and experiences targeted by each pilot in CrossCult, the result of the participants' intellectual journey, as we used to describe it, varied both by type and in form. Uh, in the applications, there were a number of interactions and features that clearly supported reflection and encouraged participants to think about historical narratives. Uh, participants' thought process was triggered either by providing them uh, content with content uh, that they connected to their personal experiences uh, through those historical stories or by exploring topics and stories uh, which facilitated consideration of historical content and narratives and uh, by playful interactions and gamification elements uh, with content that participants uh, encountered before during or after their visit uh, to the venue, um, such as the uh, gallery creation game. So this is the example of an autotelic creation game, a functionality of the uh, National Gallery uh, application, the application of the uh, created for the uh, pilot one. It was incorporated and integrated with uh, the main application and uh, it allowed us to understand how the user engage uh, with the collection. So the game itself invites the visitor to virtually move paintings around uh, to create and curate their own presentations of the uh, National Gallery collection. The screen, as you can see on the bottom left, uh, screenshot is split into sections. The collection on, uh, with the available paintings on the left and the wall on the right and paintings can be moved from the collection to the wall by tapping uh, on the painting once to select it. Then the selected painting is scaled to its correct uh, dimensions relative to the wall and as it's, it is being dragged the painting is highlighted uh, in red if the position is invalid or overlaps with uh, an existing painting. So once the players have finished with their game, they receive rewards in the form of badges for completing specific challenges associated with each badge. And they can finally save the presentation, as you can see on my right hand side screenshot uh, of the collection they created by giving it a name and a description. Um, this is what we've used to potentially identify whether the user has thought through uh, the process. Um, during the first phase, the first experimentation phase, we identified that um, logs or direct observation of the users was an insufficient uh, since we could not interpret whether people were really engaging in deep thought uh, while they were interacting with the, with the application. Um, 
Our main research question was, what are the cognitive and affective processes that are activated when users experiment with the cross-cult gamified applications? So during the uh, second phase of our experiments, we explored two out loud methods uh, of data collection. A think aloud standard approach uh, where users verbalize what they're thinking and doing, why they interact with the application, uh, and the experimenter props participants with questions when and if needed. And the remind approach developed for museums by Schmidt, which aims to understand is situ, the physical, uh, but also cognitive and emotional components of the museum experience and to explore how these components are constructed by audiences to create meaning to their journey through an exhibition. Um, this protocol is based on the theory of enacting uh, and postulates that while the participant relieves the experience of the museum visit, she identifies what is important from the user point of view and verbalizes it. Uh, the verbatims are then broken down into a set of specific codes. So we have adopted the, the Remind approach into a protocol for the experiments at the National Gallery, which we've run with 12 volunteers, 10 female, with ages ranging from 30 to 65. Uh, we equip them with uh, low-cost glasses with integrated video camera um, and allow them to freely visit the museum while they're using the application. After the visit, uh, they reviewed the recorded film think aloud and describe, relieve uh, their experience. At that point, the interview uh, that we are running afterwards with the participant synchronizes the participant description and the video of the experiment. We then transcribed the think aloud recording and we analyzed it alongside the film and the app interactions. Um, the analysis with the remind protocol in general uh, recognizes six main codes that can be used for the to break down and represent the user experience, uh, which we applied as well. Uh, and we enhanced extended with some project specific ones that emerged from the data and the verbalizations of the reflections. Now, some of the key findings um, for the um, from the uh, Remind application at the, at the National Gallery. The participants expressed a lot of positive emotions as part of uh, discovering information about the paintings um, and that actually sparked their curiosity and uh, led them to reflect on prior learning they may had about the collection and previous experiences related to the history or the narratives described uh, in the painting as well. Um, uh, an element that allowed the, uh, allowed the participants and encouraged them to more purposeful and directed discovery visit was the digital map with specific recommendations, uh, as you can see, to visit specific paintings. Um, and the discovery of personalized uh, paintings led participants to be more uh, to elaborate more upon the connections between the personal experience that they had and what they have read or observed uh, about the about the artwork the artwork um, also the personalized paths fostered their um, curiosity so they encouraged them to discover paintings in the same room even though they were not in the recommended path uh, an element that also contributed to their information discovery uh, and finally, two points connected with the uh, narrative and the text that was um, uh, presented along with the paintings. Um, reading the narrative text with specific, uh, as we call them, reflection points. So points related to the, to the painting and connected to specific themes about the artwork encouraged a closer uh, reading uh, of the painting. Um, and also encourage the participants to think about and rediscover the artworks from a different uh, viewpoint. Finally, uh, comparing the two uh, approaches. 
Um, yes. If you want to at least take one question, you need to go to your conclusions. Yes, yes, it's my final slide. Um, yes, but please don't take two minutes on this slide, otherwise there's no time left. Thank you. Um, so, with so many strengths and limitations with the application of the both um, of both evaluation methods, um, they do require a lot of time and resources to process the data uh, that are collected, uh, but they do support gathering of data beyond the standard computer science approach of usability and uh, learnability. Um, The final word was when we compared the two uh, approaches that the remind uh, protocol could be an appropriate technique for probing the internal process of reflection. Uh, and the encouraging part of the whole process was that uh, in the absence of usability issues, um, we can detect users' uh, reflection and thinking process when they engage with an immersed experience. Thank you. And thank you, Calliope, for being quick and efficient. Uh, do we have uh, questions in the chat? Not necessarily. Uh, questions in the participants, among the participants? I don't see any raised hands for the moment. Any takers? I have only time for one question. Maybe you've been so clear that no questions were generated by this talk. Anyway, thank you, Calliope. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. And we move now on to uh, talk number three, which is a short talk, in this case, a short paper titled Multimodal Study of the Effect of Time Pressure in a Crisis, Man Crisis Management Game. The authors uh, uh, a combination uh, come from a combination of Dutch universities, including Tilburg and Utrecht, the presenter is Paris, uh, well, the family name is difficult, Mavromustakos Blom, and please take the floor. Good afternoon and welcome to my presentation. My name is Paris and I'll talk to you about our work called Multimodal Study of the Effect of Time Pressure in a Crisis Management Game. Short outline of what I'm going to be talking about is crisis management training, how we implemented it through the Mayor's Game, the experiment that we ran, the data that was collected, the results that emerged, and a short discussion limitations and future work of this study. So first things first, uh, the classical crisis management training scheme uh, at present uh, consists of around the table uh, sessions where multiple experts from different institutions come uh, together and discuss in order to solve a certain crisis. This can be a simple political debate or it can be something really complex like an actual disaster, for example. Uh, those experts need to uh, develop and maintain a high level in certain soft skills such as uh, communication and teamwork, decisiveness, but also stress management. Uh, crisis management training is supposed to be a really stressful task, but do the current training sessions induce the stress that would emerge in a real-life crisis situation? We have observed that uh, crisis management training sessions tend to become repetitive and also become just another part of the crisis manager's uh, daily office routine. Uh, in order to solve that, we, uh, we propose time pressure, information complexity or information load, external distractions and other sorts of stressors that could be employed in order to manipulate crisis manager's uh, stress levels. Uh, what else we propose is using an applied game, such as the Mayor's Game, in order to provide an alternative and more effective training solution for crisis management. Uh, what the Mayor's Game is, is a 2D single-player dilemma-based game where uh, the player takes the place of a, a, an a fictional town's mayor and has to solve a crisis scenario by answering a series of dilemmas. Uh, those dilemmas can be answered with yes or no answers and uh, whatever strategy the player chooses, the end of the scenario will eventually be the same. At the bottom of the screen, the player has a text field where the, all the scenarios, texts, and all the dilemmas texts are provided. Also, the possible answers to the dilemmas are provided. And at the top of the screen, the player can see five different external advisors that provide on-demand information about the specific dilemma that the player is answering. In order to monitor uh, player stress levels, we employ the Shimmer GSR Plus physiological sensor, which among others is capable of reading player's heart rate and skin conductance. We designed an experiment where we try to induce a, a, a additional stress onto the participants. 
uh, the video stopped uh, surreptitiously. Renata, can you check whether it's simply paused or is stuttering? I promise this is not the end of the video. <laughs> <laughs> that would be quite a cliffhanger. Uh, Renata? <laughs> Uh, no, I don't have support from my technical support. Um, yes, we have a, a crash. Sorry, we're going to have to deal with this. Um, I believe uh, the next presentation is also recorded, right? Okay. Um, do you well, want me to try to share my screen? and? Uh, can you share your screen, right Paris, maybe? Yeah, of course. Uh, Thank you, Paris. Um, and we'll try to fix this for the next talk. Um, I'll open the video file first. Um, to find Remember to share with sounds. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay, this is approximately where I stopped. through time pressure. So yeah. we divided players into two conditions, control condition with no manipulation and experimental condition where in order to induce time pressure, we reduce the time it takes to complete a scenario. We um, installed an external timer on a large screen during experimentation and we frequently reminded the participants of the time that they had left to finish. We gathered 72 valid participants recruited at Twente University with an average age of 20.48 years and a standard deviation of 1.6 years. 38 of those particip participants were allocated in the control group and 34 of them in the experimental group. We collected in-game data from the Mayor's game, we collected sensor data from the GSR shimmer sensors, and we also collected questionnaire data, um, ratings of players' uh, valence and arousal scale after the experiment was over. Uh, the data collection they resulted in 52 uh, unique features that were extracted and described at the FTG conference in 2018 in a previous publication. Using the aforementioned data set, we ran a two-class prediction task where uh, the target class was the experimental condition, so zero is the control condition and one is the experimental condition. We used a random forest classifier and tried classifying uh, through in-game only, sensor only, and the combination of the two modality uh, data sets. The assumption that we made before running the classification task is that participants in the experimental condition should experience more stress through time pressure, observable in their physiological and gameplay data. What the results show, and what we see here, uh, in parenthesis we have uh, accuracy with including the questionnaire data and outside the parentheses is uh, accuracy of classification with excluding the questionnaire data. So we see that a random force classifier performed better with game only data, 84 uh, percent, uh, sensor only data gave an accuracy of 67.9 percent and a combination of both modalities gave uh, an accuracy of 75 percent. So the observation that we made from those results is first of all that uh, externally induced stress, stress through time pressure had more impact on gameplay rather than player physiology. We observed that player tended to divide their time more equally across all the dilemmas of the scenario in the experimental condition while in the control condition with no external manipulation players tended to spend more time on the first four dilemmas of the of the scenario and then rushed to finish the experiment for, uh, for the last four dilemmas. Also, questionnaire ratings did not improve classification accuracy. We observed that players um, tended to have a feeling of time pressure even in the control condition. So just the fact that there was a time window in which they should have finished the experiment in already induced a, a feeling of time pressure onto the participants, making the two conditions not too different as perceived by the participants. Third observation is that the multi-model approach should still be preferred because even though gameplay data is the best classification uh, input channel, uh, gameplay data can yield information only on player, on player strategy or strategical decisions. So we still need the, uh, the sensor data to make valid assumptions on player stress levels. Few limitations that this study runs into. 
Uh, first of all, the Mayor's Game is not presented as a replacement training method, but merely as a supplement. And in those times that we're living in, in a global pandemic, uh, the Mayor's Game and the study in general is a really useful tool for at-home single-player crisis management training. However, the, uh, the Mayor's Game is a low-fidelity game. And this means that a 2D text-based game might not be the best solution when we want to induce high levels of stress as a player, uh, as we would participants, uh, as we would expect participants to experience in a real life crisis setting. Third limitation is that we would like to run this experiment with actual crisis management experts, which are not really easy to find, but those people should be trained to have a really structured and methodical way of solving such scenarios, and which should be invariant to whatever the time pressure condition would be. Our current and future work includes a study that uh, we ran using information complexity as a stressor and yielded sim uh, similar results to this one. Also last year we presented an interface where we enable adaptive crisis management training and uh, our ultimate goal is to enable fully automated crisis management training adaptation through the Mayor's Game and through player modeling uh, through game data and sensor data. Thank you very much for following my presentation. Feel free to ask questions, I will be answering them. Feel free to contact me through my email and visit our website if you want to know more about our project. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you very much, Paris, and thank You're you welcome. for being so responsive in a moment of virtual crisis. Um, although you don't have currently any questions, um, you had a few exchanges in a chat concerning the um, not only stress coming from lack of time or too much pressure, but also from the unknowns, late lack of data, and as somebody called it, the underload of information. Can you comment on that? Uh, yes. So this the second study that I ran, um, the second study that is published this year uh, regarding Mayor's Game and Crisis Management. Um, instead of using time pressure, we decided to use information complexity, as we call it, or um, you could call it information load as well. So the, the amount of information that the crisis manager receives in order to take uh, a, a high stakes decision. And we also saw in that study, I mean, if you want me to talk about this study a little bit, is that there is, there is a soft spot uh, where people have enough information to decide and less than that information uh, leads to different decisions and more than that uh, amount of information also leads to different decisions. Understood. That's very interesting. Um, you have a very, very quick answer to offer to Jasper's question. Yes. Uh, uh, so have you Jasper, approached crisis management professionals? Yes, Jasper, uh, we have approached crisis management prof professionals. They are actually uh, participating in, in this project, but uh, the main crisis management team we work with is in uh, the other side of the Netherlands. So uh, it's, it's not very easy for me to run experiments with those people. And in order to have valid results, you would need, uh, let's say, 24, 25 to 30 people per condition, which is almost impossible to find. Uh, but yes, we have observed some of their live trainings and we have input from them and the scenarios that are designed for the mayor's game um, also derive from experts. Um, comments and suggestions. Okay, Paris, I mean, you've been very clear. You still have a question from uh, Adrian, but I think you can take it either in chat or on the Discord because I need to move on to the fourth yes. talk of this uh, section, uh, session rather. Uh, the fourth talk is another short one and addresses some of the problems left open by the first talk in this session uh, by Jasper Sherman. So maybe Alessia will find her answers in a uh, 10 minute presentation by Stefano Caselli and others from the Institute of Digital Games titled Satire at Play, a Game Studies Approach to Satire. Take it away, Stefano, and then take questions. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here on behalf of me, Stefano Caselli, and my co authors, Krista Bonello Rutter Giappone, uh, Jasper Schellekens, and Stefano Gualeni. Our intention with this paper and with this presentation is to frame satire within the field of game studies. The persuasive potential of games has become over time an established uh, component of the game studies discourse. 
Examples of that could be Ian Bogust's work on procedural rhetoric uh, on new, or news games, or the recent debate around propagandistic games. Despite this, very little has been said about satirical games or the use of satire in games. This may depend on the very notion of satire. Satire is one of the mm, most imprecise literary designations that we can broadly define as a form of fiction or narrative that makes use of other rhetorical devices with critical intent. Amongst these uh, rhetorical devices we can mention, for example, irony, humor, parody, wit, and so on. But to frame satire in a way that facilitates recognition and analysis of satirical games, we delve into two main interacting features of satires, namely perceived critical intent and entertain entertaining purpose. For what concerns perceived critical intent, satire uses wit and other rhetorical devices to criticize, as mentioned before, its targets rather than to be just funny. It has always had a sort of reforming intent or moral purpose or commitment. Also, satire always aims at hurting a certain target, as this recent example of Charlie Hebdo makes pretty clear. For what concerns its entertaining purpose, uh, we based on Bates and Ferry's definition of entertainment. We defined entertainment on the grounds of the interaction between a communicative external stimulus and uh, an audience. This interaction also has to have pleasure as its main goal to entertain. By merging these two aspects of satire, uh, one could be led to admit that satire is opposed to the ludic or to the playful. On one hand, in fact, its critic intent contrasts with something playful. On the other, entertainment is defined as an experience of spectatorship more than an experience of participation. Even postmodernist takes on satire conceive its playful as just a, a question of tone. Our attempt is instead to uh, that of bringing play back into the foreground, reconnecting, the, reconnecting uh, sorry, the ludic and critical intent through the notion of rhetoric, rhetoric. To grasp how satire can be expressed through the participatory and playful activity of playing a game, uh, we at first base uh, on uh, Ian Bogle's procedural rhetoric. Procedural rhetoric can be defined as the practice of using processes persuasively or as authoring arguments through processes. By describing how games can convey meaning through gameplays and rules, procedural rhetoric can play an important role in our analysis of the satirical effects of a game. On the other hand, of course, procedural rhetoric has to be appropriated by players to convey meaning. Players are in fact free to express as well to explore uh, values, meanings and so on during the game experience. Another important notion useful to understand satirical games is that of implied designer. We can define implied designer as a conceptualization of a designer that the player construct, uh, constructs on the basis of its dynamic interpretation of the game experience. As a consequence, um, uh, the implied designer is a subjectively inferred figure constructed upon the game experience as a whole. By interlinking these concepts, we can, for example, notice that the way in which the implied designer and the actual designer can diverge reminds us of the distinction between a direct and an indirect satire. Bogus cow clicker <laughs> is a clear example of a self-reflexive game uh, aimed at criticizing social gaming conventions that has been misunderstood and interpreted as a sincere social game by players. This has happened because uh, the author's intent uh, is realized within the game and not made explicit. And this of course reminds us of the difference which uh, Helia takes into account uh, between uh, direct satires and indirect satires. Another thing we can notice is that satire in games is ultimately context-relative. Uh, 
The implied design, as, as well as how players appropriate of the procedural rhetoric of the game, determines if the game is perceived as satirical or not. For example, the case of uh, uh, Marco Alfieri's Call of Salvini uh, makes clear this point. To understand the Call of Salvini, not only one has to know Italian politicians or political context, but most importantly, one has to assume that the game designer also knows the car that context, that same context of uh, Italian politicians and, Ita and political context. At the same time, one has to infer that the designer of the game is willingly making fun of that specific state of things. This paper is a first step in our dealing with satirical games. Further avenues of this research could consist in providing uh, analytical frameworks to look at satirical games, as done in a paper which will be presented in, in this same session of FDG, and focused on the board game construction boom by Stefano Waleni, or in favoring uh, further discussion about uh, uh, around in-game relationships between entertainment and critic, or around the degree of player participation and or interpretation in perceiving uh, uh, satire in games. I thank you all for your attention, and of course, every question will be welcome at the end of this presentation. Thank you very much, Stefano, for your very clear presentation. Um, do we have questions? We still have two or three minutes. So Good we... enough. <laughs> Alessia says no question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, if nobody has anything to add or any inquiries, then we could probably move on. Let me see. Final check, final call, no takers. Okay, so what is going to happen now is that this same room will be uh, the room where uh, the game criticism and analysis track uh, has its final session, followed by another and final session by, of uh, Games Beyond Entertainment. So we start again with similar topics around five. Um, I now give the uh, microphone to, I suppose, Renata or Gordon or whoever is coming later. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the questions you asked. Thank you for being great presenters to everybody. It was great. See you in an hour. Thank you, Stefano. Uh, we'll resume on the dot, so at um, zero, zero. I liked your talk, Stefano. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was very clear, very short, to the point. And yeah, you just said that, uh, what do you say? It will be presented in the same tracks. Yeah, you didn't say before or after. So that was fine. I didn't okay. feel like commenting about it. Glad to hear. I may misread uh, the schedule <laughs> or just forgot about that when recording. <laughs> Remember, but it's author satire and we discussed that but okay that's it was really yeah. good really clear i think alessia was pleased so that's great that's it thank you ah, still recording. By the way, hello everybody who's listening now i'm gonna stop the recording